Okay, we should be good Very to good. go. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, let's call to order the January 2023 meeting of the Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District Board. And uh, our very first step is uh, I'm going to turn over to Julie Sherman to swear in uh, several of our new directors. Julie? Uh, Donna, are you able to screen share the oath? Oh, uh, no, I had given that to Michael. I thought Michael was going to be doing that. Okay, let's see. If, um, is that electronic? Maybe Michael could screen share or is it a hard copy? I, I just have a hard copy here. Oh, okay. um, sorry, I didn't know there was going to be a switch. <laughs> That's okay. I, I think I can probably find it pretty quickly. Yeah, and then I can read it. It just may be helpful for them to have it on the screen so they can I agree. Read it, repeat it. Uh, but let me see if I can quickly find it. Elizabeth, do you by chance, um, are you able to pull that up by any chance? Oh, let me see if I can find it. Okay. I apologize. I'm I'm remote today and I don't have everything right in front of me. Yeah, Donna, I found it so I I can share okay. my screen. Awesome. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Okay, here we go. Please repeat after me. I and then state your name. I, Mike Scott Newsom. Newsom. Do you solemnly swear or affirm? Do you solemnly, Do you swear, solemnly swear or affirm? That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support, that I will and, support and defend the Constitution, and the Constitution of, of the United States. United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the, and Constitution, the Constitution of the State, State of California. California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take, this, I take obligation this obligation freely, freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without, without any, any mental, mental reservation, reservation or purpose, or purpose of, evasion. of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties upon which I am about to enter. And that I will well and, will well and faithfully, faithfully discharge the duties upon, upon which I am about to enter. Thank you. Welcome and welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, Julie. All right, um, moving along, we get to uh, an actual roll call. Donna? All right. Uh, Director Brown? Present. Director Downing? Present. <clears throat> Director Dutra? Here. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Present. Director Koenig. Here. Director Lind. Here. Director McPherson. Not seeing him. Uh, Director Newsom. Present. Director Pegler. Here. Director Rockton. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. And we hope to swear in uh, ex officio Director Henderson and the Watsonville rep at our February meeting. Very and we good. do have quorum. Great. Thank you, Donna. All right. And under announcements, I'll note that uh, today's meeting is being broadcast by the Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Thank you for that effort. 
We appreciate your work. Item five brings us to my nomination of board officers and committee assignments. And in your packets, you will see in item five, three pieces. One, uh, part A shows who our current officers and committee members are. Five B is simply the summary of the current SEC IC members. And five C is my proposed slate number one. Now I want to note that other slates are welcome. And uh, there are certainly slots there for uh, up to four. Uh, the primary changes, uh, let's see if I can pull up something on my screen. I will note just summary. Uh, I am nominating Jimmy Dutra as chair, Shepard Kalantari Johnson as vice chair for the coming year. When we get to the committees, I've asked Jimmy to take the seat that was previously occupied by Donna Myers on the Capital Project Standing Committee, joining Bruce McPherson and I and continuing in that role. I've also uh, emailed Scott Newsom to ask if he would be able to attend as uh, the project at uh, Pacific Station uh, certainly involves the city of Santa Cruz and Donna's role in that was uh, very helpful in keeping communications flowing well in the early stages of that project. The Finance Budget and Audit Committee uh, pretty much remains the same with the same four officers renewed. Personnel and Human Resources Standing Committee, the change there is that Donna Lind would be stepping off as past chair. I'd be filling that seat. And if the officers are approved, Jimmy Dutra and Shebra would serve as current chair and vice chair. The SEC IC reps, I'm nominating Bruce McPherson, Shebra Kalantari Johnson, Manu Koenig, myself, and Rebecca Downing. And when we get to the RTC representatives, at this time, that third primary seat, following Kristen and Mike, uh, Ari Parker's seat, is still open. I'm waiting for the nomination of Watsonville's additional representative to the board. I've proposed that I serve as alternate one, that Shebra serve as alternate two, and Donna Lind continue as alternate three. And that's a quick rundown of the slate. Now, Donna might step in. Um, we will not be voting on this until the February meeting. Um, I, any directors can submit additional slates. Uh, I believe they submit them to Donna, or we can talk about it here. It will certainly be uh, discussed in February. And I see Donna Lynn's hand. Donna. Yes, and I, I uh, when the time's appropriate, I would like to present an alternate slate. Any other questions from directors? We might just go to Donna. Go ahead, Donna, take the take it. Well, I, I would like to propose um, that um, the only changes I would would propose would be for chair and vice chair, and that would be for uh, Shebra Kelleter Johnson as uh, chair and Kristen Brown as vice chair. And my reason is that neither of them have had an opportunity to serve as chair. Um, several of us have. And Jimmy had at the last uh, time that he was in 2017, I believe, when he was last on Metro and prior to cycling out. So I just feel like it would be an opportunity for others who have been serving to be able to serve in the chair and vice chair position to have that, that uh, opportunity. Any other comments, directors? Um, Donna, did, uh, Donna Bauer, is there any other uh, process? Should people submit these uh, alternate slates to you for consideration in February or? Um, if they have something else they would like to submit, yes, please. And then that will be in the February packet. Okay. Okay, so Donna Lynn, thank you. And I imagine you will be submitting a slate. Mike, I, I see Mike. No other changes to what okay. I, yeah. Just the two officers. Just those two. All right. Mike Rotkin, I see your hand. Yes, I, I just want to make a process suggestion. That if there are no other alternative slates, that we find a way to have a, um, just two votes in effect 
um, you know, where the whole the thing that everybody would agree upon is one, and then the, if there are different slate opinions, do that separately, rather than being forced to have five or seven votes on every good other point. slate issue. Oh, very good. I appreciate <clears throat> that. That will make for a much easier February. All right. Any other comments on this item? Uh, I'd like to make a comment. Jimmy, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Larry, for your um, nomination. I really appreciate it. And you know, in past, um, you know, the, the way the past processes is that you know people, the vice chair becomes the chair, and um, you know, and then last year when that process came, you know, there was a choice between me and Bruce. Bruce would have been on the same path. So um, it's really interesting that Donna is choosing to, you know, make that argument when Bruce would have been in line for to be chair this year. Um, but I do want to remind everybody that as of right now, you see that I am the only voice from South County sitting on this screen. And, um, you know, a vote did go to the um, Board of Supervisors to try to fill, to try to get another representative from South County um, to have their voice in here. Um, that did not happen. So I remain, I, right now I'm remaining before someone else gets appointed, there's going to be two of us, but right now I'm the only one in this meeting. Um, my, I've been very faithful to this organization. Um, I, you know, I was one of the only very few people that um, went to the barbecue to support our bus drivers. Um, you know, I stay really active in, you know, the processes that um, are being, you know, implemented here um, for our transit because I realize how important it is for South County and and being the second largest city in the county, um, a lot of a lot of, a lot of our um, residents utilize the bus system. So you know, I, I take this really serious. So I, I, you know, I would hope that um, my voice remains on, um, you know, the um, executive team, which it is now, um, you know, I, when I show up to the meetings and the breakfast meetings, um, my voice is, um, you know, representing a, a, a part of this community that, um, you know, wouldn't have a voice. And um, so, um, I hope that is, uh, you know, being considered um, when we move forward. And and I, you know, I would love to work with Shebra, and Shebra would be the chair, you know, the following year. And um, you know, I would, and maybe Kristen can follow in after that. That'd be definitely something I could support. But um, you know, right now, you know, the way we've been doing it in the past is there's been a process of how you know people become chair, and um, you know, I to have Donna Lind want to circumvent that. I just have an issue with that, but you know, it, if we can keep with that process and you know maintain the voice that we have, and if you think about it, you know, there's no, going to be no representative on the um, RTC from Metro um, from South County. Um, you, we're basically getting pushed out again. So I hope everybody can um, you know keep that in mind when they're voting. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. I'll, I'll reiterate, Jimmy, that uh, I'm hoping that the new appointment from the City of Watsonville may serve as our third RTC primary rep for Metro. Uh, Donna Lind, I see your hand, please. Yeah, and as as uh, Jimmy mentioned, last year, Bruce was vice chair and would have, or prior year, would have stepped forward. And he he actually said, I'd rather see someone who hasn't had an opportunity and, and had suggested that Larry or, or someone who hasn't had an opportunity be able to give that rather than him stepping forward. And then he agreed I think at Larry's request to stay as vice chair to help mentor and guide. But even at that point, he said, you know, I've been chair before and I think it would be good for others to have that opportunity. So that that didn't happen last year either. Um, and then of course the vote removed him as vice chair. But um, I give, you know, I, I actually think that that's one of the times that I, I thought about it when Bruce was mentioning that several people had had repeat terms and others said had none. So that that first got me to think about it. that happened with me as well. John Leopold was supposed to move into chair and um, didn't and wasn't reelected and had said, hey, Donna hasn't had an opportunity. So that was my first time to serve as chair. So I have served once and I know others have as well. So I think it's something that is only fair that that is I mean, I, I could plead for North County, you know, too. I think the chair that all of us on the board are representing our communities, and it doesn't have to be in the chair position, that uh, we all serve equally. And um, I'd like to see others on the board have that opportunity. And Thank I you, do Donna. appreciate Jimmy's service 
Yes, I was at the barbecue. There were very few of us, and he has definitely been supportive, so it's nothing negative as far as Jimmy, just an opportunity for others. Thank you, Donna. Um, Alta, did you have a comment? I did. Um, I've, I've been noticing just as an ex officio, and I am representing Cabrillo, so I go from north to south county, and I live in south county, and so it will be nice to have a voice on this committee, on any of them actually, that lends to what our students are saying um, who are traveling across counties and not just, you know, it's separated in theirs. And so I've noticed just the pattern and I just wanted to point it out that it seems that anytime Jimmy or a South County resident it, uh, rep is appointed to something, there is a reason to change the rule. And I just wanted to insert that as my observation. Thank you, Alta. And and I, I will underscore something Donna said, which it, it isn't really a rule, I guess, because I became chair last year. So um, here we are. Any other comments? Seeing none on this item, I would move to board of directors comments. Do we have any comments from the board on other items? Rebecca, good morning. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I just wanted to express my gratitude uh, for the invitation to the Bay of Life reception last mm -hmm. Saturday. Uh, the ecology of the Monterey Bay was one of the reasons my family moved here, and it was really heartwarming to see this uh, incorporated into the uh, Metro campaign. And Michael, your comments and the use of the podium to share our latest work and ridership goals with the community was quite inspired. I think you made a big impact. And thanks to Danielle, the project is off to a fabulous start. Uh, the buses parked out on the curb that night with the mountain lion and the whale tail were very big and bold and looked even better <clears throat> than the renderings that you had shared with us earlier. And uh, I got to visit with Jesus Garcia, who was the perfect uh, choice to welcome guests to the first two works of art that will be rolling out the program. He was a great ambassador. So thank you all. Great, thanks for mentioning that. Donna Lind, I see your I, hand. I want, I, thank you, Rebecca. It was good to see you there and it was an outstanding event. I really, I wanted to commend Danielle and Michael, both, both of you just represented Metro so well. And it was, it was a wonderful event. And um, I, I mean, Metro was certainly credited throughout from the various speakers for our uh, support and participation. And that, you know, we need to thank our staff for Michael and staff. Great job, made all of us proud. It was, it was really wonderful to be there. Very good, thank you, uh, Manu. I see your hand. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add my commendations as well for Michael and Danielle. Uh, the, the new buses uh, with the wraps look really good, and I think they're going to catch a lot of eyes around the county and. I mean, especially just highlighting the fact that these are zero emission buses. Um, I think they're going to start to, to get people thinking twice and, and wanting to ride the Metro. Um, and that's, of course, exactly the purpose. So um, great job. I'm looking forward to also seeing more buses roll out with these wraps. Thank you. Mike Rodman. At the risk of extending this, I just want to say uh, thank Danielle for the uh, not only the, the idea and pulling this stuff together, but for the publicity that we've gotten about this in the Sentinel and other places, I, I was um, I was aware of it and had seen the information before. But I was uh, on actually I had on my bicycle uh, out on the west side of Santa Cruz, and I saw I think it was on the twenty route twenty, on one of these buses that went by. At first, like what's that? And, then, and I looked at it; they're just amazingly beautiful, and they go by. They're really stunning, and you can't help but notice them. And, and it's a great way to bring attention to public transit. So thank you, Daniel, for your work on that. And I will echo the same appreciation. I thought it was a terrific program. I haven't seen one of the buses in person yet, but I'm looking forward to it. I, I also want to acknowledge the Metro staff who assisted during some of the uh, storm yeah. emergencies. Um, we saw information about our bus operators who uh, moved some students from uh, a camp in Boulder Creek back down to Scotts Valley so they could get back home safely. Uh, I know Michael was filling sandbags uh, down in Watsonville at one point. I think some other of our staff were. Um, and I, I did observe a, a Reddit post of a bus driver who assisted uh, someone whose car had stalled in the middle of the 1-9 intersection and, and helped them get it out of the way so traffic could move and then got back in the bus. and. Uh, 
that kind of support for our community is most appreciated. And I, I very much want to thank everyone who's had a part in that. I see Bruce McPherson has arrived. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, Hello. I've, I've been, I've had a tough time getting in here. So, okay. uh, and I heard the conversation, uh, conversations. I want to thank uh, everyone who's in this storm related, about, especially Michael. We ought, to, we ought to know this as a board that he, he contacted me and his church had 150 people who wanted to volunteer. I directed them to the volunteer center. They got out there front and center. I mean, he's putting Metro out there uh, with all his uh, colleagues at his church uh, so, and so forth too. And, uh, and as far as the event went, it was just great to be, uh, this is a celebration of this Bay of Life book. I don't know, I didn't get to hear everything, but uh, it's phenomenal. And boy, that was a great uh, effort to have uh, the, the bus right with Jesus, one of the drivers uh, with us, uh, right out in front of the museum. It was a tremendous event, so thank you very much. Thank you everybody, but thank you especially Michael for getting 150 people out there, help people respond to this storm-related action. That's great. Thank you for that, Bruce. All right, any other comments? Um, seeing none, I think we're going on to item seven, oral and written communications to the board. Donna, I don't think we had anything new. You're muted. There you go. I'm sorry, Larry. That's okay. Uh, can we just back up and make yeah, a please. motion to approve the nomination slate oh. put forth for consideration at the February meeting? Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll move we approve that uh, those nominations to and but there note that there'll be others possibly added. Yes. Second. We have a motion from Rotkin, a second from Koenig. Can we have a vote, please? Director Brown. Aye. <coughs> Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colentary Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Newsom. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Uh, Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. There we go. And thanks for the reminder, Donna. You're welcome. All right, oral and written communications. I don't believe we've received any additional written materials. We have not. All right, uh, oral communications. I'm looking to the public here. I see one hand from uh, Rohan. Uh, Rohan, you're welcome to speak, please. Yep. Uh, hello. Yeah, so for um, those of you that don't know me, my name is uh, Rohan Chuli. I'm a fourth year econ and electrical engineering student at UCSC. Um, and I want to provide a comment about uh, Metro's response uh, in agenda item 7.1 through 7.4 um, to some written comment about overcrowding on the UCSC routes. Um, so in Metro's response, uh, it says that the reduction in service hours provided to UCSC service was 15.4%. Um, but I calculated service reduction uh, using the GPFS data, uh, and I got 32.7% um, service reduction compared to the service in 2019. Um, and I'm so I'm really curious what the methodology that Metro used to get to the 16% number was, um, since the number I got was so different. Uh, the methodology I used was that uh, I looked at, I downloaded the GTFS feeds uh, for both the current service and service from the winter of 2019. Uh, and then for each day of the week, I summed up the total run time for every trip uh, on the UCS routes. And 2019 was different because days of the week because there was extra like Tuesday, Thursday service on the, the 15 LC on the 22. But I added all these up um, and then for weekend service as well, and then for the total week, that's 32.7%. Uh, uh, so I just want to make sure that that, um, that number is correct, um, that is in the, in the, in the board agenda, and that's going to be in the public record. Um, and the other thing is, so in, in that uh, metrics response, uh, one of the things they say is that there is a, 
you know, Metro cannot increase service to UCSC because there's a significant driver shortage. Right? That makes sense, right? You can't pull new bus operators out of thin air. Uh, but there are definitely some key changes, near-term changes that Metro can make to significantly improve the surface without needing any additional operators. Uh, one of the ones is making sure that the surface operates on even headways for the different corridors. Um, for example, there is two to three times more ridership on Mission Western corridors compared to Upper Bay. The Upper Bay has more service, and the service on Upper Bay is not even. Right, the 15 runs seven minutes behind the 19, um, and then there's a 23 minute gap. And it seems to me it would make a lot more sense to run the 19 every 20 minutes run the 18 every 20 minutes, then on any of those corridors, your wait time would be less, and there would be more service in the areas of UCSC West Side Network where it's needed most. Right, thank you, Rohan. Um, I'm going to ask our uh, planning staff if they're available to comment on, on, on this item. Um, I don't know. Well, yeah, I'm, sir, sir, I'm I'm John, go ahead, there you are. I'll just comment uh, very briefly uh, for the data. We compared current service levels uh, scheduled versus pre-COVID service levels. Uh, Rohan has my number. I have his. We can coordinate uh, on future conversations related to the data. I also want to point out that this month we kicked off our Reimagine Metro effort, which is a comprehensive operational analysis of all of Metro service and routes. As part of that, there is a, a specific effort to recruit focus groups at UCSC, to which we have invited uh, Rohan particularly and the community at large to participate. And this will this will be uh, this will kick off an effort to plan better service at UCSC that meets meets the community's needs over the next twelve to fifteen months. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, next uh, member of the public, I see Jessica Corona. Would you like to speak, Jessica? There you go. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Jessica Corona. Um, I'm a mom of a San Jose State student. We live in Ben Lomond. He wrote an email to the board, I believe, back in December about the Highway 17 service. And uh, he's just started back this semester on Wednesday and is at class today. So I told him I had the day off and I would speak. Anyway, that's the whole background about the Highway 17 Express. We are hoping that the, there could be buses stopping in Scotts Valley during maybe the commute times, maybe 6 to 9 a.m. and say 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, when it skips Scotts Valley and goes straight to Santa Cruz, then he has to hop a bus from Santa Cruz back up to Scotts Valley, which he had been doing before, but now, as you know, the Highway 17 bus on the other way from Santa Cruz to San Jose State now does not go all the way. It stops at Derridon. Then you have to get a VTA bus to San Jose State. So there's just, there's so many pieces. And just in this time, like he's having 12, 13 hour days and could maybe have 10, 11 hour days makes a big difference. Um, he's also working and things. It's just, it's become uh, one more complication. So if you could look into that of maybe having more of the routes stop in Scotts Valley, especially, well, not only on their way back, but also to get there. And that's it. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, John, would you like to comment? Yes, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the comment. We understand the inconvenience that the service change on Highway 17 uh, caused this winter. We did it out of necessity as we've been portraying all along. We're, we're very short on operators and the operators that are working are working lots of overtime. Uh, but given some recent success in hiring, we are planning to restore three uh, a.m. commute period trips and three p.m. commute period trips that will serve both Scotts Valley and San Jose State, and that'll start March 16th. Um, so that should improve that situation for that. We also did reach out to San Jose State, who pre-COVID used to fund two late evening trips for Metro to operate. They did not get back to us in time for this bid um, for the spring service change, but potentially, again, given 
uh, operator resources, we might be able to add late night trips uh, in summer or fall. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, I see a hand up from Garfield Yang. Garfield, here you go. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I personally had an issue. So I personally would like to describe like the metros being dropped and then the infrequency of buses that walk in the face of something faster. I personally have encountered multiple times with the bus route 18 or 19 having buses dropped. I would check quickmetro.com and the time schedule would say the correct time, but no buses were dispatched or sent out as the time is grayed out and there's no active buses because of UCSD around that time. Due to this experience, I would calmly check quickmetro.com to see if the route has any buses. This issue has presented to me around 9 p.m. on a Monday during winter fall, winter fall quarter of this year. I was finishing up a meeting and wanted to get home as soon as possible. I checked quizmetro.com and it prompted that the next bus will be around 9.45 p.m. or so, and it was around like a 30-minute wait or so. And I said I could take an Uber and I would be, I would arrive home faster than the bus. I said the time I waited for like five, 10 minutes because I was assuming that the bus could be delayed, the bus could be late. So I waited a few minutes here and there. I saw no single bus. So I decided just to call an Uber, just to get an Uber and get home as soon as possible. However, once I called the Uber and the Uber arrived, the bus was right in front of that Uber that I was planning to take. But I already, I already paid for the Uber, so I just took the Uber and went, well, I, just had, I had to do with the consequence. Next time is that I've had an experience with buses being infrequent, uh, both during the weekends and during the weekdays, both on campus and off campus. The very first time I encountered this issue was around when I was living on campus. It was usually a weekend I had to go somewhere and I figured out that I can go there. It took me a 30 minute walk for a 17 minute bus ride. My first thought was, I'm gonna test, I want to test the bus. So I got up 30 minutes early and was thinking, I'll ride to the location 30 minutes early because it was like every hour during the weekend. I'll be like, that's fine. I'll just arrive the 30 minutes early. I'll be fine. I can just do other stuff over there and then I can just hang around there. And then I waited, I'll be waiting at the bus stop 10, 20 minutes. And then I would still arrive at the location 10 to 20 minutes when I was planning to go. And then, then I figured out I can just walk to the location and walk 17 or 30 minutes and be much more accurate than waiting for a bus. And then it happened again off campus when I was riding to a certain place and I figured out that riding to, riding when I, when I was trying to ride to the place, I missed the bus by a minute and I was able to walk to my location faster than the bus was actually going to take and this is on a weekday. And the problem has made me as a writer doubtful that the cruise metro as a company can provide a reliable service as it has been a co commonality that all routes are delayed five to ten minutes from their scheduled time. In addition, the constant need to check cruisemetro.com as buses may be cancelled or dropped without the writer's knowledge and would have to proceed to wait around an extra 30 minutes, an hour, depending on the time. Thank you. Thank you, Garfield. Um, all right. Any other comments? I'm not seeing additional hands. Uh, John, do you have any additional uh, response or? I would just uh, invite the speaker to join our reimagined metro effort that again is kicking off this month at UCSC and, and countywide. There will there will be opportunities for the public to weigh in and how we can make Metro fast, frequent, and reliable for everyone who wants to. Very good, thank you. Mike Rotkin, I see your hand. I just wanna belabor the point that um, this is not a good model for getting people to make become lifelong uh, transit users. I have students late, late to my class, um, two of them at the last class. Um, and it, as you can hear from our last speaker, I mean, at some point people just decide this isn't working for me and they start to decide they're going to become car users forever and we should be moving in the other direction these days for a whole range of reasons i don't need to elaborate including climate change um and so i know I, i'm not blaming anybody for this our staff are doing their best to hire new people and so forth but this is not a small consequence of having people just feel like transit is just not working for them and you can't blame them i mean it's i, I myself you know <clears throat> um you know a committed transit user and, and um, bicycle rider and motorcycle rider and have a car. But at some point you just decide this isn't working and you, you make a different life choice that doesn't just affect you while you're a UCSC student, but eventually for the rest of your life in terms of how you get around. So we really need to double up our efforts to hire more uh, drivers and try and you know fix this problem. So again, I don't, 
I think our staff are doing their best. I'm not saying anybody's doing anything wrong here, but the people just need to be aware that this is really tragic on some level. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Donna Lynn? You're muted, Donna. I thought I might be. All right. Uh, the one thing I thought about, too, that we might uh, share is the app that will help with the on-time app being able to be another resource um, that could help. Obviously, as we struggle with uh, staffing and drivers, you know, there's that's an issue, but maybe it might be a time to talk about that app as well. Good point. All right. Any other uh, comments from public or directors? I'm seeing none. Um, with that, I'd like to go on to item eight and ask if there's any communications from our labor organizations. I see James. James Sandoval, please welcome this morning. Hi, good morning, Larry. Good morning, everyone. Uh, James Sandoval here, uh, chairman of Smart Local 23, who represents the bus operators and paratransit operators at Metro. Um, I want to thank you for your leadership, Larry, as the chair. Um, you didn't change one bit. You still showed up to our Spark meetings. I still saw the passion from you, and um, you did really great. So I just want to thank you for everything you've done. Scott Newsom, welcome to our board. It's going to be, um, I'm looking forward to meeting with you. I do have a relationship with everyone on this board. So hopefully one day we could sit down and talk about transit and what your goals are being a board member for Metro. Um, I also want to speak to, uh, the slates that were being proposed, um, I, I will say that both slates, uh, these are all great people, but I, I do have to lean on the fact that the, the, the concerns were brought up not too long ago about um, Watsonville's voice. And as Jimmy pointed out, he is the only board member here from Watsonville. And, you know, Watsonville does rep represent half the population in this county. So at least if we could figure out a way to make sure he's on the executive team, because uh, from my understanding, we might have development happening in Watsonville for, you know, uh, another location for an, another yard and that kind of stuff. So um, just to make sure someone from Watsonville is voicing or has a voice on the executive, te executive team. And I do want to um, say that Mike Rockin and I, um, when those concerns were brought up, not short, not too long afterwards, we did get to, uh, get to sit together and talk about all the issues that were brought up and, figured out together where uh, the communication breakdown was happening and how we both could do better moving forward to make sure that we're collaborating on issues. So I just want to thank Mike for his time and making sure that the relationship's still there and that we're going to continue working together. And um, the last thing is talking about the floods. I just got to give a shout out to everyone at Metro that came together, understanding how important it was for us to be there for our community and our drivers working around the clock, making sure that all the calls were being responded to and getting people out of the places that needed to be getting out of um, them, dealing with their own issues, having to evacuate out of their own locations, even being trapped at homes because the bridges collapsed where they were living. Um, it was crazy. And uh, Michael Tree's leadership getting us through that too was great to see. So um, uh, he's gonna probably speak to some of the specific stories that happened. I will just wanna share one story real quick. And it is from one of our newer drivers here. Um, his name's Carlos. And uh, he was one of the Highway 17 drivers that was stuck with his passengers for over five hours. And uh, he couldn't go down 17 because of the mudslides. He couldn't go through 101. He was trying to get back from Santa Cruz. There was basically no way for him to get back other than going up to Half Moon Bay and going down Highway 1. And he was with his passengers for so long. And everyone was starving. And he actually had his wife meet them somewhere along the route to bring them food and take care of the people on his bus. So um, not only did we get people where they needed to go, we really took care of them. So I just, I really appreciate everyone here and making sure that, you know, we took care of our community. Thank you. Thank you, James. And thank you to Carlos and his wife. That's uh, above and beyond Call of Duty. Uh, Brandon Freeman. Brandon. I know. Uh, yeah. I, I think Mike had something to say. Mike, did you want to go before me? No, I'll just say quickly, I want to thank James for his comments and just point out that it's not easy to be a union rep. And James does a really good job of fiercely representing his members, but still uh, putting putting uh, the transit district right there in, in uh, front and center in terms of what gets done. So really a good model for what how people can be union activists and still really make a commitment to the uh, to their employers. And so I want to thank James for his work. 
Thank you. Go ahead, Brandon. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome, Scott. Uh, welcome to the board. Uh, introduce myself real quick. I'm Brandon Freeman. I'm James II. I generally fill in for him if he's not available. Um, got a few things to go over. First one, I'm just going to straight endorse slate one. I like everything that I see on there. I totally get it about trying to bring new people in. I'm not sure that this is the time to bring new people in. Uh, we got a negotiation coming up here fairly soon, so you may want someone who's been through that before at the helm. Um, in addition, Jimmy is someone who kind of goes above and beyond over uh, what I've seen out of some, you know, other others. I'm not trying to put anyone down, but dealing with a lot of the scheduling stuff for the union, uh, Jimmy is very easily accessible, always there to make sure that the input is there having his voice heard, making sure that his people are taken care of out in Watsonville. And he makes a lot of extra time to do that outside of, you know, regular functions to meet with us and make sure that his, his opinions and the voices of Watsonville are heard. So definitely want to uh, endorse him for the next chair. As far as some of these scheduling issues and our staffing, uh, I think it's important to let you guys know if you haven't realized that uh, the number of operators we have this January is exactly the same as last, even though we've hired so many classes. Our attrition rate is severe. We are re-adding service, not because we have extra operators, but because we are taking more work on with the ones that we have. This is why our attrition rate is this severe. As of last week, you had 16 people hitting their maximum 80 and 8. We do not have the ability to run any more service. Now, I know that UCSE has been an issue. We've been having some pass ups, but I think Michael has a really good solution with that. Looking at some of these articulated buses out of San Diego, trying to push these hydrogen articulated buses. As of right now, we own four. Only two have been alive in the last month and a half. Um, we have a shortage of mechanics. These buses are very old. They're 2003s. They're past their life. If we get our entire university fleet running in articulated buses, we should be able to take care of a lot of this pass up stuff. And I know that Michael has found the opportunity to do that and we're sending people down to San Diego to check those out uh, Monday, I believe. So hopefully there will be some relief coming out of there. As far as the buses dropping, Bus dropping, um, I mean, nobody wants to drop service, right? We, we really don't want to have to do that. But when we do, we have to take a look at what's dropping and where in terms of the overall picture. UCSE has 10 routes an hour that go to campus. Other places have one. Um, when it comes down to what we're going to be dropping, it's still better to run nine routes there to university and cover that one that may be going into Aptos or than maybe going deep, deep into Watsonville or maybe crossing the county. Um, like I said, nobody wants to do these things, but these are things that we have to do. We, the more we increase the service, the more we take care of the people who want to go downtown San Jose, who want more university service, who want to go wherever it may be, the less buffer we're going to have for when things happen. Especially now COVID is still a thing. People are working longer than ever. They're being more stressed out than ever. They're going to use more sick time than ever because they're just going and going and going. It is inconvenient to have to wait 30 minutes for a bus. It's additionally inconvenient to be a driver and not get out of that bus for six or seven hours. That's what we're doing currently. So we are doing everything that we can to try to alleviate some of these things. Trust us, we, we definitely know where the issues are at. Um, John and I probably talk way more than either one of us would like trying to figure out these uh, <laughs> different problems that we got going on. Um, so, you know, I just want to make sure that you guys know it, it's not being ignored. It's not like, oh, well, there's nothing we could do. So we stopped talking about, it. no, we're constantly, constantly, constantly looking at other ways to try to figure this kind of stuff out. And then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was, uh, actually from my, my good friend, John Ergo with the, uh, the free fare for the youth. Um, that's something that I also want to endorse. I think that that's something that would be really good for the youth of our County. Um, I know a lot of times, especially for myself, a lot of the um, work that I do with the school kids is, is up in Bonnie Dune or up in Boulder Creek. It's not always easy for them to come up with fare. It's not always, you know, maybe one person has it, maybe their friend doesn't. I mean, at this point, does it really matter? It's not, it's not a whole lot of money. And these are kids, right? I, mean, I don't propose that we go fare free all the way out, but for the kids, I think uh, 
that's something really solid that we could do for them and try to get them on the bus because I see them out there. You know, maybe that next time, if they know they can show their ID and get on that bus, that pack of 15 kids you see walking home, they might be on our bus. So I think it's in the best interest of everyone for that. I want to endorse that. Like I said, slate one, and we will continue to do everything that we can to try to get this service where it needs to be. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Mike, I see your hand up. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. I'll just say quickly. Okay. Uh, we, we, we did, I think, a good job. The, the transit district did a good job of trying to address the issue of uh, finding a way to encourage more uh, hiring of new bus drivers. But Brandon brought up a point that I hadn't really not thought about, which is, you know, the issue of attrition on the other end. We do have bargaining coming up. Um, it'll, you know, of course, it's up to the union to decide what it is thereafter. But as far as the needs of the district, we might think about issues about longevity pay or other. I don't know what it is that, you know, would encourage people who are thinking about possibly leaving, or, uh, leaving early or earlier than they otherwise would to uh, stay with us. And but that's something we might want to think about. It made a big difference in our hiring when we increased the uh, initial starting pay. We found a clever way to do that without increasing the overall costs um, in any, you know, uh, in a bad way, but maybe there's some ideas could come up about ways to deal with the attrition problem. That's it. Good. Thanks. Brandon, thank you for mentioning the additional uh, articulated buses we're going to be getting from San Diego that I hope will help with many of the capacity issues on the West side. Um, Jordan Vasconis, I see a hand. Would you like to speak? Jordan? Right now. Uh, good morning, Board of Directors, and uh, welcome, Scott, to the board. Uh, first off, I'd just like to say, start off by saying um, I want to endorse Slate One. Um, I have an existing relationship with Jimmy, and I know he's great to work with. So with uh, no, with uh, negotiations coming up, I think that that's going to be a, a good thing. Um, and then second, I just want to say that um, as the representative of like the administrative staff here at Metro, I just want to say that I can see a lot of movement to kind of improve service. And, you know, I just want to say my heart goes out to the students. I know there are a lot of people who, who um, see Pat, who get passed up and, you know, have routes that don't quite work for them. But I can just say um, the admin staff are doing the best they can and they have some good challenges and I'm definitely seeing steps moving forward to improve service. Um, a quick shout outs to HR for all the recruiting they're doing for operators and mechanics uh, planning. They're doing the best they can with um, our operator shortage. You know, we have the COA study that's going to give us like some really good information. Um, um, another shout out to marketing. We know the buses look great and that's definitely making people's head turn um my own department it we're working on getting new technology on buses so i just want to ensure the public that we are definitely making big steps on improving service um that's it for now thank you great thank you jordan um brandon i think your hand is just still up from your previous I, I did have one more no, go right bit. ahead all uh, right I, I forgot larry obviously you know because you join us quite often Service planning and review committees are open to the board members. I am now formally inviting you second Tuesday, 12 to 2. We need to move it to Zoom to make sure that you guys can get there. Please do come so you can see kind of the inside of what's happening with our planning. Um, it's a it's a meeting that has been long standing. The contract language does say that we're supposed to invite you. So you have all been formally invited to join us in the service planning review. And Brandon, I'll, I'll uh, add on that I'm hoping in my retirement from chair to uh, encourage many directors to come and ride buses so that as we go through the COA process, um, all of us better understand the actual experience of our riders on the routes in our areas and across the county. So uh, I'll probably be tapping you to uh, help plan some of those. Whatever we need, we'd always love to see you guys out there. Thank you, Brandon. Jimmy, I see your hand up. Hi, thank you, Larry. Um, maybe Donna, can you work with Brandon and um, those of us that want to get it on our calendars and the links? That way, we can have an easy access to those meetings. So, if you can add it to mine, I'd really appreciate it. And maybe work with any other um, member on our board um, who wants to add it to their calendars as well. Thanks. And I'll note, Absolutely. I'll note that Rebecca and I are general attendees each month, right now. 
Thanks, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comments from our group? I see no hands in public. I see nothing from our panelists. I think that takes us to item nine. Donna, I don't think we have any additional documentation. There is none. All right, thank you. Then we have a consent agenda that's relatively long. Are there items in there anyone cares to pull or in a motion to approve? Asking directors. I'll move. Uh, Shebra, I see a hand. I can second. Well, I don't know who said I'll move. I can second. I think it was Jimmy was the motion. Should that just the public? Uh, yes, thank you. And I'm also looking to the public if there are comments or questions on any item on the consent agenda. I'll give it a moment. Show your hand if you'd like anything adjusted. I'm not seeing any. So I think we have a motion in a second. Donna, a vote, please. Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Colin Terry Johnson. Aye. Director Koenig. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Newsom. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you. All right, moving to our regular agenda. The first item is a presentation of Employee Longevity Award to Michael Miller, 25 years working with the Metro. Uh, I don't have any other information. Um, I don't know if he is here, but I am very pleased to congratulate him on 25 years of service to the Metro. And uh, I do need a, a, a motion and a second to uh, adopt this presentation, I believe. I'll move not the adopted. On this one. No, no, you don't need a motion on this. Not this one. Not on this one. The next one. All right. One. Thank you, Donna. All right. Well, Michael, uh, we very much appreciate your work. Thank you very much. The next item is a retiree resolution of appreciation for Catalano Vasquez. And uh, there I do need an action. I will move approval of that resolution. <laughs> Mike. Second. We had a, a motion from Rock, and I didn't see the second. Donna? Donna yep. Lynn. All right. Motion in a second. For Catalano Vasquez. Um, roll call vote, please. Director Brown? Aye. Director Brown Downing? Aye. Director Dutra? Oh, did we lose Jimmy? Okay. Uh, Director Koenig? Or excuse Aye. Me. There he is. Um, there he is. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Director Colin Terry Johnson. Sorry. Aye. Uh, and Director Koenig. Aye. And Director Lind. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Newsom. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. And Director Rockin. Aye. And the motion passes. Thank you, and Kat, enjoy retirement. Thank you very much. That brings us to item 13. John Ergo is going to tell us about the Youth Ride Free Pilot Program. John, turn it over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, uh, Directors. John Ergo, Planning and Development Director. Uh, I'm excited to bring this item, uh, which again is a recommendation to approve a 12-month Youth Ride Free Program, uh, waiving Metro fares for regular service for K-12 youth. In recent years, the concept of free fare transit has been gaining momentum uh, both at the state legislature in California and among transit agencies statewide. Many of these programs have targeted youth specifically in an effort to encourage mode shift in the short term and build lifelong transit riders. In 2021, for example, the Orange County Transportation Authority began offering free rides to all youth ages 6 to 18, and in 22, they made the program permanent. Santa Rosa City Bus launched a similar program the same year. Uh, and saw youth ridership exceed 125% of pre-pandemic levels. The Sacramento Regional Transportation District has seen similar youth ridership growth uh, compared to pre-COVID levels, and a study released in 2021 found that the program not only increased transit ridership and school attendance, but demonstrated a significantly, a statistically significant decrease in automobile usage 
especially for those who used to get a ride uh, in a car to and from school. There are many other agencies throughout the state in Los Angeles, San Diego, and San, and San Francisco Bay Area that are planning or have launched similar programs. And given the, the success of these programs and numerous other studies that have documented the link between exposure to transit at an early age and continued use in adult years, staff is recommending that the board consider and approve a 12-month free fare youth pilot program here at Metro uh, beginning in March 2023. The intent of this program is to support Metro's goal of increasing transit ridership to 7 million trips within the next five years, expanding access to opportunities and resources for youth, and support equity by eliminating the fare burden for youth, many of whom come from low-income households. The program would allow, as, it, as its name implies, youth in grades K through 12 to ride local Metro service free uh, anywhere and anytime Metro operates, excluding Highway 17, and in order to facilitate an easy and expedited rollout, given that we're beginning this in the middle of the school year, we do not plan to require a specific fare card or any special documentation. This is common among uh, other agencies as well. And basically, youth grades 9 through 12 would be asked to show a student ID when boarding the bus. Youth grades 8 and under uh, may be asked to identify their grade level or the school they attend to the driver. And if the school provides an ID, we'd ask them to show that upon boarding. Um, and that's it, basically, uh, in terms of proof and uh, eligibility. We estimate a financial impact of the program to be between uh, $68,000 a year using FY22 youth fare box data and $245,000 using FY19 youth fare box data. Either number is roughly 3% of fare box revenue. Uh, going forward, staff will look to identify sustainable funding sources to move beyond a short-term pilot stage. And the state legislature has actually made this uh, easier for us. In 2022, uh, the legislature passed Senator Josh Newman's SB 942, which makes it easier for transit agencies to use low-carbon transit operations program funds for fare-free and reduced fare programs. Metro receives around $1 million annually in LC top funds. In FY22, we committed these funds to the operation of the zero emission Watsonville circulator for two years fare free, uh, but future funding years could be dedicated to the youth ride free program. Other sources could include funding from local jurisdictions, such as cities, the county, school districts, in Sacramento, for example, it, the transit agency partnered with local institutions to fund its ride free RT program. Uh, SFMTA and Uni received a $2 million, $2 million appropriation from the city of San Francisco and the San Diego Metropolitan Transportation partnering uh, with the County of San Diego and SANDAG on a formal year-long pilot uh, for Youth Ride Free. Besides the anticipated fare revenue loss, there is the potential that the program could result in ridership increases that require additional buses or drivers, and Metro may face pressure to reallocate service from other areas or increase service at a time when the industry and our agency itself is facing an acute labor shortage but we've talked about this today already. And so we wanna make clear that at this stage in the program, we're not planning, nor do we have the resources to expand any school for focused service. Um, we'll monitor ridership and performance, and we'll take up school service planning, uh, particularly as part of the reimagined Metro comprehensive operations analysis that again, kicked off this month. Um, if the board approves this program, we'll begin outreach to the school districts. And I believe Michael has already done that um, to share uh, information with parents uh, and to help spread the word that beginning in March, this program will kick off. We, we've already received very positive uh, support for the idea. And I'll just wrap up on a personal note. As some of you may know, while I've been coming to Santa Cruz since the early 1980s, I actually grew up in New York City where I had a free transit pass my entire school age life. I know that experience shaped me and my experience as a transportation planner. It's why I'm here doing this job and has also led me to seek out car free and car light lifestyles wherever I've lived, uh, much to my wife's dismay. There's certainly a cost associated with these programs, but the benefit of building lifelong transit riders in this county would seem to outweigh it. We of course need to have the service there that's fast, frequent, reliable for people to take it, but reducing the fare burden is certainly an early step and getting uh, our youth in the county riding early uh, will build uh, future benefits for the agency itself. So.
So I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Very good. Thank you, John. Uh, first hand I see is Donna Lind. Well, I'm thrilled for this program and I, I know there's some challenges involved, but uh, particularly with the changes in the school times that um, you know, states mandating schools start at 830. I know all of us in all of our jurisdictions are hearing a lot of concerns and complaints about traffic congestion around school time. And um, if we can, as we move forward, be able to be a resource and take some of those um, cars off that road at that time and, and have students feel comfortable taking the bus and um, this be an alternative that will, I think, resolve a lot of issues throughout the county. So thank you. And uh, even though there's maybe some work to be done, I just think this is a great program. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Uh, next, I see Manu Koenig. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just can't overstate my enthusiasm for this program. Um, you know, I met with some Aptos High School students uh, yeah. just before the holidays, and the first thing they asked me for was uh, free metro rides because they have just experienced, um, you know, challenges with, with with their own school bus service, uh, particularly in Pajaro uh, Valley, uh, Pajaro Unified School District. Um, and so they were saying that a lot of time they, they fall back on using our metro service. Um, so I know this will mean a lot to them. Um, it, it also just makes so much sense in terms of encouraging the next generation of metro riders. You know, I know we've looked at providing free bus fares uh, to our community as a whole, and it just doesn't work out financially for our organization. But I think this is really something we can do that's, that's going to make a big difference. And as Donna said, you know, school traffic is such a huge impact on traffic in our community as a whole. I mean, you see it um, during during holidays. I remember speaking with someone at um, the Watsonville Farmers Market who said, you know, she commutes from Aromas to downtown Santa Cruz, and a lot of the time it takes her an hour and a half. But if it's spring break, hey, it only takes her thirty minutes, forty five minutes. So this is definitely a great place to focus our efforts, and. Um, you know, after speaking to those high school students, I reached out immediately to John and Michael and said, hey, we got to do this program. And they were already working on it. So I think it just goes to show uh, our staff are really uh, riding the wave and cutting edge. And I can't thank you enough. And I'm looking forward to supporting this program however possible. Thank you, Manu. Next, I see Shepard Kalantari Johnson. Yeah, I'll echo um, Commissioner Koenig's comments. I also met with some youth groups and reached out to Michael right after, and you're like, yep, we're on it. So really, really happy to see this come forward. Um, that was the various groups that youth groups I met with throughout the county. This was one of their top asks. So it's going to be significant. I think it positions us well as we see state legislation change on this and as we shift the culture in our young people, then like you said, John, um, that bodes well for future writers. Um, and I think it's an opportunity to educate the parents of young people who will be taking advantage of this opportunity. Um, I did have a, a question comment. Um, I, I saw the outreach um, efforts that were listed in the uh, agenda report. And, and you mentioned that we've already started on these out, uh, outreach efforts. I wanted to ask who are our stakeholder groups and are we connecting directly to young people themselves? I think it's great that we're connecting with schools and school administrators and parent groups, but I think it's important to get this information directly to young people, get in front of them, um, share this information because that's how it'll spread. They'll use whatever apps they use and, and share it among their peers. So question comment there. Yeah, there. Well, at least over the past year, there have been two youth groups, one based in Watsonville and one in Santa Cruz, that have contacted us directly, uh, requesting free care for youth programs. And so we'll certainly reach out to them directly. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Michael has already reached out to a number of the school districts. I, I will say, you know, we're we're just trying to maybe do a softer launch for the rest of the spring and we'll kind of gear up for summer and really uh, do a stronger launch with the beginning of the school year next fall. But we, we look to the board and community leaders to help us support the outreach efforts uh, for sure. Great. And if you don't already have the questions, yeah, contact yeah. questions you have, please share them with us. Uh, yeah, and I'll just say right now, and I can email you, um, COPA Youth Group and Youth Action Network are two youth groups that have wide reach, but I can email you Great. later. Thank you for Thank these you. efforts. I'm looking forward to supporting this. 
Great. Thank you, Shebra. Next, I see Mike Rodkin. Yes, first, uh, I have to say this is the most common request from the public in my over 30 years on this board uh, for, for uh, free, free transit for youth. Um, I do think it's important to make sure we uh, also say the unhappy comment that John Ergo made earlier, which is we uh, really are not in a position to begin totally readjusting our routes to serve schools and become a school bus system. Um, we, we just don't have the funding. It would be great if we did, but we don't have the funding to make that happen. And people should be aware of it because pretty quickly after we implement this, we're going to start to hear pressure for how come we don't have a route that goes from my house to my school. Um, and, and, you know, we want to make sure that people understand the limits of what we can do here. I also think we should um, think seriously about applying for grants, both to airboard um, and to congestion relief uh, organizations for funding for this, because it, it'll make a huge difference in the morning, particularly in the morning, but in the morning and the afternoon commute times. Uh, or not, it's not um, work commute times, but for the school uh, times in the afternoon, but particularly in the morning when the streets are just full of people driving one child to school in the morning uh, to have to have them able to, where they are able to take a bus to school, make that happen. Um, I don't see any reason we shouldn't apply for discretionary grants of a variety of kinds to deal with that congestion. And obviously it's gonna affect the air quality if we get a bunch of people out of single use uh, occupancy cars and have people taking the bus instead of driving there again one child to school in the morning so we should be you know, get, uh, alerting our uh, funding staff to begin looking at applying for grants from those kinds of agencies thank you very much for this uh, program thank you mike and i'm sure Wanda to move heard that uh, he's observing today uh next we see jimmy dutra so <clears throat> i want to first of all say um Wow, uh, Michael Tree, you come in and you're doing such amazing things with uh, Metro with one ride at a time now to this. I mean, it's really nice to be giving positive um, programs to our community um, in a time that so many people, there's so much, they feel there's so much doom and gloom. So, um, you know, these programs and these, these steps we're taking forward to make the lives easier for people um, is really important. Um, I, I don't. I think I have a question. I um, I'm not sure if you've already spoken with PVUSD, but you know I think that this um, will help. We have a we have a school bus. Um, we have school buses in our school district, so um, this would actually probably offer more routes for students to um, get on a bus to go to school. So I'm not sure if you've coordinated with them at all. Um, or if they know it, or I'm not even sure how they would feel about it. But I did speak, I did go visit on Wednesday, a school called Saba um, in Watsonville, and they have 500 students. And we were just talking and we, we actually talked about this program. And um, the school actually pays for uh, annual bus passes for, for a group of their students because, um, you know, the students take that, that they use Metro to get to that school because it's not part of the, the school district school bus system. So um, maybe if you can reach out to them, um, you know, this also saves the school's money they can put back into the education and back into the kids. So I think this is really important. So I think for schools like that, um, that's gonna um, be very helpful. So um, again, I wanna say thank you. I'm really looking forward to this. And, um, you know, maybe if you can connect with that school and, and you know, um, maybe reach, touch base with me you know, later about um, PVUSD, what those conversations will look like um, so that we can maybe create some sort of, uh, um, you know, relationship or conversation with them. Thanks. Thank you, Jimmy. Next, Rebecca Downing. Um, I just wanted to echo what everybody else said. No need to repeat it. It's so exciting. Um, like John, I grew up in an area that had really good bus service. I didn't have a free pass, but I rode the bus at everywhere. It was relatively inexpensive for uh, youth. Um, I wanted to ask if there's information that you were talking about that you've, that you've shared with schools. Um, is there information you can provide to us as board members that we could share just with the general public? I mean, we know the benefits, but sometimes you have reluctant parents who want to know more before they put their kid on a bus and, and that sort of thing to just help us uh, improve and increase this because the more the more of these cars we can get off the street, the better the traffic is, and also it'll be some people's very first 
ride on a bus. And uh, I think you want to make it really exciting and fun. And that way you will get more adults riding the bus too. Maybe they ride the bus with their uh, child on the first try or whatever it is. So I think anything you can give us to help other people uh, get rolling would be great. Um, I also wonder two things. Um, clearly, if we have increased ridership, will that improve our bus service times if the traffic is decreased? And if there's any way we're going to measure that? And is there any way on a whole that traffic is going to be measured? I think of these morning commutes like Mike was talking about. Um, is there any other entity that's going to measure general traffic uh, patterns because of this during the school year. Like clearly it won't be happening during the summer. That's all. Uh, Larry, can I just say one thing to uh, San Lorenzo Valley, uh, the combination uh, measure D, uh, the highway nine improvement from Felton to the school uh, is gonna be immense. It probably won't happen until 2024 five but uh, it is gonna be a, a great asset and this is gonna help a lot to get those kids uh, to school in San Rosa Valley. It's, uh, I just can't overstate how much uh, of an improvement this is. I, I foresee this is going to be for the people of San Rosa Valley. So thank you very much, uh, Michael and the team for putting this in order and let's get it going as soon as possible. Thank you, Bruce. I'm glad you pointed out the uh, work already underway on, on Highway 9. Michael Tree, Michael. Yeah, I you know I'm super excited about this uh, project and um, really appreciative of uh, Board Member Downing and her comments because I think this will be for a lot of folks taking advantage of the pilot their first time on the bus system and they and their and their parents for sure uh, you know I think would appreciate um, materials. And uh, to that, I just wanted to make the comment, uh, Danielle and I met yesterday to look at the marketing plan for this pilot, and it's really robust. I mean, you're going to see a lot of uh, media attention, a lot of information going to the school districts and the students, and uh, even some ambassador-type programs at the school districts with the students themselves promoting the pass and helping others, uh, you know, uh, learn how to ride the bus system. So... It's going to be fun to watch this. Uh, we did fare free in uh, Livermore, Dublin, and Pleasanton, where I was last serving. And uh, if you walked around the community, uh, you know, I did on occasion and just asked people what's top of mind about the bus system there in that area. It was the student pass. And they really felt that that had a huge impact on traffic around the schools when those buses would roll up uh, completely full. So I'm excited. Very good. All right. Um, I see no other comments or questions from the board or the public. Uh, entertain a, a motion. I'll move. I'll do that. Oh, okay. Go ahead. whatever. <laughs> it was at once. Let's see. I think that was everybody. Jerry. Right. It's everybody. Everybody. <laughs> Yeah, unanimous motion. Uh, Jimmy Dutra, I think, was the motion. Shebra, I think, was a second. That's okay. I don't know who's who spoke up. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Boxes are lighting up on my screen. It's hard to tell. But all right, we have a motion and a second. Donna, if we can, is Donna still here? Oh, maybe Elizabeth is taking Donna over. Got connector, so I'll be doing the last roll call. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Director Brown. Aye. Director Downing. Aye. Director Dutra. Aye. Director Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Director Koenig? Aye. Director Lynn? Aye. Director McPherson? Aye. Director Newsom? Aye. Director Pagler? Aye. And Director Rockin? Aye. And the motion passes. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. This will be quite a program to watch. I'm excited that we're putting it in place. Our next item is uh, the Metro Advisory Committee semi-annual update. And I know that James Von Hendy and the Vice Chair are unavailable, but I, I see Michael Passano among the um, our public participants. I don't know, Michael, if you have any comments you might care to add, but we have a two-page summary in item 14 of what the uh, Metro Advisory Committee has been doing for uh, this last half of the year. 
They do this report twice a year. And uh, I encourage you all to take a look at it. It gives a good summary of their uh, the focus of their attentions and efforts. Um, and I think we might, do we need to uh, accept this? Michael, Elizabeth, do you know? No, we don't. All right. So well, we, no, we do accept it. We don't need to vote. We accept it. it. There's no action. <laughs> no, no motion for it. <laughs> no, no action necessary. All right. Well, thank you. With that, uh, I turn it over to Michael for his uh, CEO report. All right. Um, listen, happy uh, 2023. It's our first board meeting of the new calendar year. So excited to be here. Excited to welcome uh, Scott Newsom onto the board. Uh, I really look forward to to meeting with you and uh, to talking about uh, Metro and all the great things that we have going and all the great employees. Uh-oh, he's frozen. Let's give this a well, second. That was a quick report. Well, the technology is not what we need it to be. If he had to be frozen, at least he's got a nice expression. I've been. <laughs> uh, I'm texting him if that helps. He's like that famous stature, the thinker. <laughs> yeah, right, right, Rodan. <laughs> That's great, Jimmy. <laughs> well, I, I won't steal any of Michael's thunder, but just until he comes back. Um, I wanted to note that uh, the Equity Transit's doing a number of things next week in celebration of uh, Rosa Parks date. And I think Monday night, uh, there's a uh, panel discussion that Michael Tree and James Sandoval, um, Justin Cummings, uh, Adam Millard Ball, who is a professor, was a professor at UC Santa Cruz and now teaching at UCLA. And I think Vanessa Quiros Carter are on. And that's, I believe, Monday night, 6 p.m. at the Resource Center for Nonviolence. So there's some other activities going on next week as well. He has, we'll get Michael back on here. I know he has things to tell us about storms and give him a moment. Very soon we'll be meeting in person and these kinds of drop-offs probably won't occur. Or if they do, it'd be a pretty grim situation, would, let's say. Shocking. <laughs> Look across the room and suddenly Mike Rockin is gone. <laughs> uh, Did someone call him or text him and let him know? Well, I just texted him, but I'm worried that if his internet doesn't work, his... Uh, is he's there, he's there, work. there, and Elizabeth. There he is. Here. Yeah. Okay, we've got him back. And uh, just unmute yourself, Michael. There we go. All right. I am Elizabeth Rocha for a few minutes. <laughs> Larry, Larry did mention the equity transit stuff that's happening. So that's something you could miss if you were planning to talk about it. Other than that, go go for it. Great. Did uh, did Julie chat for a second about the Brown Act? We were going to talk about just what we foresee. No, no. I, I haven't. I texted you to see if I should go, and then you you came back. But gotcha. I'm, you want to just take a second? Yeah, I'm ready. Uh, would you like me to screen share that document? Do you think that'd be helpful? Um, I'll leave it to you as to what you feel would be best, sir. Okay. Maybe a show of hands, because you, you all may have gotten a lot of this information from your appointing jurisdictions. Uh, you know, as you know, after February, the governor is planning to lift the COVID state of emergency, which means the virtual meetings you've been having under AB 361 are going to come to an end unless that is extended. And so you may have already heard there's an alternative teleconference statute that was adopted that went into effect in January, and I am prepared to go into some details on that if you all would like, and I can screen share. I have this little sheet where I kind of summarize the main things. If you think that'd be helpful, if you want to just 
you know, raise your hand, I can put that up. Otherwise, I can just talk it through with you. And if you want more information, I can send it to you, you know, to your email. I would certainly so appreciate, yeah. What? I would appreciate. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So let me see. Uh, I think I've got this. Yeah. Let me know if you're seeing it. We yes. see it now. Very good. Okay, great. So now I just have to figure out how to get my view because my my view is not showing for some reason. Uh, again, this this won't happen in March. <laughs> um, I cannot see it. So if I scroll, is it moving for you guys? Yes, yes. it is. Okay, cool. So just a reminder, before we had AB 361, we had the traditional Brown Act teleconference rules. And these are these weird rules where, you know, you have to put where you're going to be on the agenda. You have to post that location, you know, at your hotel room, you know, wherever you are at a conference or whatever mm -hmm. location. And it has to be accessible to the public and you have to allow the public to attend at your location. Um, super very antiquated. What AB 361 did is it, it suspended those rules for the last three years, essentially. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and then during that three-year period, there were a lot of efforts to get new legislation that would change these traditional teleconference rules to give board members more flexibility in being able to teleconference without necessarily inviting the public into their homes or their vacation hotels or whatever. Unfortunately, uh, those efforts were, I would say less than successful. We got one bill, AB 2449. It started out as a really good bill. It was supported by most public agencies. As it went through the sausage making process, most, if not all, of those public agencies withdrew their support for the bill because it just became, um, I, I guess I would say, it's not a complete dud, but it's it's a lot less than people wanted. So, but this is the new bill, AB 2449. It is now an alternative to the traditional teleconference rules. And there are two instances in which board members may participate remotely, and that is for just cause or in emergency circumstances. In both cases, you have to inform the board as soon as you know that you'll need to take advantage of this. If for just cause absences, you have to announce at the beginning the reason for your participation, remote participation. We, you know, I would say that in my view, just saying you meet one of the just cause circumstances would be fine because I don't think you need to disclose private, you know, health related reasons. Um, and just cause is defined as one of these four circumstances, and a lot falls into that. And for example, we had a client last week that there was a contagious illness and we got to use this. So, again, so, so being on the beach in Maui is not a just cause. It is not a just cause. <laughs> you would have to do the traditional teleconference rules for that. Uh, being a beach in Maui may not be publicly accessible. <laughs> but anyway, you, you know, we, we can work through those those questions as they arise. And then if it's not just cause, it may fit into an emergency circumstance, which is a physical or family medical emergency. Now, so, so far, it's, it's not too bad. You don't have to put it on the agenda. You don't have to worry about the 72-hour rule where you have to have the, the location on the agenda at least 72 hours in advance. Um, and a lot can fall under those, you know, a lot of valid reasons for needing to call in fall under these definitions. You may only use these twice a year total for just cause and emergency. Doesn't make a lot of sense. You can't plan emergencies, but you only get two emergencies per year. 
and you would get it per body that you serve on. So if you're, you know, you're obviously a board member, but if you're also on committees, you could use it for the committees as well. So you would get two per year per body that you serve on. So it can be helpful. And then there are a, these bullet points here are things that the agency will have to meet for every single instance of these just cause or emergency circumstances. There must be at least a quorum in person and, a, and an accessible location. Uh, we have to have a two-way system to allow members of the public to also be remote. And I think staff is working or has that technology. We have to put on the agenda the, the teleconference information. So what we would do is we would make sure we put that agenda out, the revised agenda, as soon as we knew one of these circumstances was there. And it could be in the morning of the meeting, if that's the earliest we know. And, and then these other rules, the teleconferencing member has to be on both audio and visual, can't just be on the phone. And then if there's anyone over 18 in the room with you, you have to disclose that. So like I said, it's, it's not a complete dud of a bill, but it's a lot worse than we were hoping for, but it will give you some flexibility to teleconference a couple of times a year. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Julie? Mike, I see your hand. Yeah, how does this relate to our ability or desire to have hybrid meetings in the sense that we're there in public, let's say all the board members show up and we're having our meeting, like at the RTC, the Regional Transportation Commission, um, they take comments from the public on oral communication and, and every item, both from people who are in the room, but also who are calling in and get covered that way. Are we planning to do that or is that not part of what we think about in our future? Are we gonna have hybrid meetings or just show up at the meeting in person and, and that's it? So, so I'll let, let Michael talk about the plans for the future, but in terms of the legal requirements, you could offer have a hybrid meeting and you could have staff, you know, call in, you know, video in, any board members that teleconference it in under either the traditional or the alternative rules. And, but you have to, uh, you, and you can allow the public to use those virtual tools, but you do have to allow the public March 1st to be allowed in the boardroom with you because it has to be a public, a publicly open meeting. Right, but I mean, let's say we do our meetings as we in public, people show up, there's an audience, we're in some room somewhere, the County Board of Supervisors, me or the council chambers or something, but will people be able to uh, watch us on TV? I mean, they can watch us now on TV, but we don't know they're there. I mean, they're sitting home watching TV. Um, we're gonna actually have uh, uh, actual attendance by remotely, is that going to be something in our plans or not? That's my question. I'm, and I'm not pushing for that. I just like to know the answer of what staff are thinking about at this point. Yeah, Michael wants to address that. Michael? Well, believe it or not, my internet connection's unstable here, so everything's kind of warbly. So I didn't catch all of that. Um, I was just asking if we plan hybrid meetings in our future where we'll be there in public with the exceptions that Julie just noted, but will the public be able to um, comment on items, say remotely and have us see them on a screen or so something? I don't know how it would work. You know, I uh, I was looking perhaps just for some, uh, some guidance uh, as we go along today. Uh, I don't think we have a hard and fast on how we envisioned um, moving forward with that, Director Rockin. Well, I'll just say my views, I, I'm not pressing hard for it. I know it would be difficult for staff to arrange that. How, you know, how do we get to see the people who are calling in um, or hear their comments or, and or see them? Um, maybe we're not quite ready for that, um, but I would leave it to staff. As, at this point, I would say, look into the, maybe Isaac and others, look into how that might work. And at some point, if we feel like there's a model that's not a complete 
you know, nightmare in terms of actually operating it and stuff to present that to us. But I'm not pressing the meeting to do that tomorrow. Obviously, some members of the public would feel better about attending our meetings if they could do it remotely and not have to drive to wherever the meeting is. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jimmy, I see your hand next. Thanks. I just wanted to comment on what Mike just said. I, you know, at the city of Watsonville, we've been back in person for a long time already. I probably, it's probably been over a year. Um, and uh, we don't do we don't, we're in person only. We don't we don't have a hybrid system, and we're we're working on upgrading our um, our system here. And the and we have a nice chambers. Most of you have been into it, so um, we we seem like we're functional, but we're not at that level of being able to bring the public back in. And it's very 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 expensive. I mean, to offer that it's um, and so that's an investment we're looking into to making here. But I'm telling it's. I don't know if Metro has that kind of money to um, add for upgrades um, to, to that kind of system. So um, I think that is something that, you know, maybe a further conversation to have if that's an investment that this board wants to make or Metro wants to make into upgrading their system. I mean, Michael's having a hard time right now just staying on. So you can imagine how frustrating it would be for the public to, to kind of, you know, put both the, the in-person and um, the, the teleconferencing in. So. Um, I, uh, that's just my, my comment on that. Um, I wanted to also say, um, maybe aim to Julie, Julie, is this currently right now? Um, not so right now through the end of February, you can call in from wherever you want. You don't need to post, um, yes. where you are or allow the public into your home. Correct. Okay. And then come March 1st, that changes. Um, but it's kind of going, it's kind of the same. It seems like you have to unless you have just cause or an emergency, which you're only allowed twice a year, um, you have to, uh, um, you have to post where you're going to be and open it up to the public to come into your home or wherever, whatever that's going to be. Correct. And um, so I, I think that this might, I mean, I think that the staff might just have to be ready for a teleconference every single meeting because if someone's sick or an emergency, they're probably not going to find out till the night before. Right. So um, so I would think that staff would have to be prepared every morning, every, um, like the evening before or the morning of just for those people who are going to be calling in late. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And they will need to have that technology ready to allow the public to do the same thing. And so are we ready March 1st for that technology to be in place, Michael? You know, I think I'd need to go back with Isaac and the IT team just to see where we're at with things and, and give you a good report in February. Okay. I think that's going to be super important just because, I mean, I know how it is here, and I can only imagine if we haven't started any of that, it's going to be almost impossible to to be bringing in the public and missing, um, if there's three of us out at a time, I mean, how, how you'll bring us all onto the same call is there any way to indicate, you know, when we want to speak? I mean, is there a process? I think that's something we need to walk talk through. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, Manu, I think you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, recognizing Jimmy's concerns, I just want to uh, give a vote of uh, support for hybrid meetings. Um, you know, that we've been having them successfully at the Board of Supervisors and uh, RTC meetings. Um, and uh, you know, even even today at our meeting here, I found the two comments from uh, the UCSC students to be extremely helpful. And, and I don't know if we would have heard them if you know they weren't able to call in. Um, so uh, you know, I've just seen really with all the organizations I'm a part of that we are reaching more people uh, with hybrid and uh, continuing to to support it is, is beneficial. Um, I've also run my own town hall meetings as hybrid meetings. I mean it. it you know, uh, even like small organizations like the sanitation district have been doing hybrid meetings. So it is possible, I think, you know, with one of those owls, uh, even in the middle of the table. Um, I would also ask council, you know, as far as providing technology for the public to, to participate via, you know, a traditional teleconference meeting, I mean, couldn't we just, uh, a, a director calling in via traditional teleconference rules, couldn't we just make sure that our computer with Zoom was available for a member of the public to comment on, you know, sort of the same way a traditional speaker phone would be available. I mean, wouldn't that meet the requirement? 
Yeah, I mean, the statute basically just says the local agency must set up a two-way system for the public to participate remotely. So that's that's pretty broad. It, I think it could even be just a phone-in number if you needed to come up with that. But, you know, Zoom would be fine. Other agencies, like you said, use that OWL technology, and that works pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's, it seems to me my my understanding of that statute, as long as that the public had the opportunity to, uh, you know, speak through our computer if they wanted to participate from the lo a location that a director was at, that you know that would satisfy it. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Donna Lynn. Yeah. Uh, similar to what Manu said, we've been having hybrid meetings uh, for several months. You don't see the speaker, but we don't see them here either. Um, it just, they, um, our city clerk is monitoring Zoom, and as chair, we simply ask if there is anyone from, um, you know, in the audience from remotely, and they can speak and we can hear them. So um, we certainly didn't have a big budget. We were able to do upgrades and have been managing that and it's going well. It's, it's awkward for the chair because you have to get in the habit of asking if there's someone remotely wishing to speak and it's just getting into that habit of doing it. So it's it's working well and I agree that uh, we are getting more participation as people have learned to use to be able to to uh, join us remotely as well. So it's it's not not been difficult uh, for us and we have a very small staff and have been able to manage that. Thank you Donna. Shepard? Yeah, I'll just chime in. City of Santa Cruz has also been doing hybrid for quite some time and um, it's been effective and I think it has increased uh, access for a community to be able to chime in. And and we, ha we have been able to actually, I think, make someone a panelist, a speaker a panelist so that we can see um, their face if that's needed. So um, I, would, I would also support and advocate for us to do hybrid so that we can have increased community participation. Thank you. Thank you, Shebra. I'll offer a perspective from uh, my experience with the RTC during some of the hybrid meetings, where as a Zoom user, I can see everyone who is online, but I'm not clear on which of the commissioners are actually in the room and who the public might be that are speaking. Um, I've had other occasions where in person, the use of the microphone was not always consistent. And so you may not be able to hear the person in the room speaking over Zoom. So those are a couple of the downsides for being remote during a hybrid meeting, but not just talk to them. Michael, are we bringing this back to you for uh, the rest of your report, or are there things we need to do with this for Julie? You know, I, I think we'll um, we'll take a look at the technology on our end, and then we'll work with uh, with the chair and the vice chair and get ready for the meeting coming up in February and have a recommendation to the board as far as what we can do and uh, both short term and long term. Okay, very good. Sounds good. Anything else for your report? Yes, I, you know, I do have a couple of slides I was going to show you, hoping good. that technology works, but. Uh, as long as you can hear me okay, I'll keep I'll keep moving. <laughs> keep moving. All right. Uh, and I'm okay to share here, I think. Everybody see those slides okay? Yes. Okay, let me uh hopefully start them. Got it. All right. Well, hey, listen, I uh, first off just wanted to make sure the public knew that it's been a rough couple of months with the strike that was taking place uh, at the university and the changes to uh, some of the routes there, the service levels. And then we rolled right into the storm events. And certainly we were uh, modifying routes with detours and uh, and changing schedules as we went along in the storm events. But um, there were a lot of great things that happened at Metro. And, um, you know, I, I think it's been mentioned that a lot of staff went out and uh, helped with sandbagging in Watsonville. You know, just in the in the pictures there, you see Wandamu in the upper left. Uh, he's your capital uh, project guru and your uh, writes your grants. You see Monique, uh, she's your HR. 
uh, guru with Don. And then in the lower picture, you see Jordan. Uh, you heard from him a little bit earlier today. Uh, Jordan, Dimitri, and Isaac are the bottom three in that picture, all from your IT department. And then you've got Chuck, your uh, your CFO. So, you know, I think everybody just recognized that if we were pushing paper at the moment uh, and could set things down, it would be better use of our time to get out in the community and help. And so really grateful for all the staff at Metro who, who did just that. And especially with the drivers and uh, the mechanics and the other folks at Metro, uh, they were working around the clock during the storm event. And you'll see in that picture there, the flooding that came up in, onto the yard where we normally park the buses uh, here on River Street. And so we were constantly moving buses around to make sure we didn't have any damage to the buses. Uh, as well as just uh, other things that we were doing to, you know, inform the public of the detours and the scheduling with some drivers being out because of flooding events in their own homes uh, and, and so on. Let's see if I can click here. Uh, you know, just one other slide here uh, that mentioned some of the things that took place. Um, there were evacuations that took place. Uh, on January 4th, you'll see the larger buses went up to the YMCA uh, youth camp, evacuated over 200 youth. And that was a big deal. That was a pretty stormy day. And I would say the roads were pretty dangerous. So uh, big hats off to the drivers who you see in the bottom middle section, uh, Oscar, Mark, Manny, Mario, Ron Bushnell. Uh, these are the guys that went up and, and took the students down off the mountain and got them to Scotts Valley for their uh, ride home, ultimate ride home. And uh, also on uh, January 4th in the evening time, we evacuated 39 uh, senior residents from the Willowbrook Residential Care Facility uh, to the Santa Cruz Bible Church and then took them back home a, a day or so later. And then I, I know uh, where top of mind, January 9th, we also did some evacuations with the Paracruz service. And the Paracruz, uh, actually, this is your door-to-door -door service. It was open 24-7 during the times when there were evacuations in the community for folks to, uh, to get a ride and to get to safety. So just a big hands off to everybody that uh, was working so hard. Here you'll see the one ride at a time event. And so if you haven't had a chance to see these in real life, they are amazing. And um, just as a reminder, this, this project really has two components to it with the ultimate goal to raise money to protect the Monterey Bay and uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains, the habitat. The first component, uh, you approved a sustainability policy a few months ago that allows uh, vendors who want to do business with Metro to set aside 5% of the contract value that could then go towards the one right at a time project. And in other words, that money would flow right into two identified uh, nonprofits, the Marine uh, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, and then the Bay of Life, uh, which is a project that has a portfolio full of uh, nonprofits that whose objective it is to protect and heal the Monterey Bay. And so uh, Franz Lanting and Chris Ekstrom, they're shown in the bottom middle picture. This was the Bay of Life kickoff and was really great. And then as mentioned, you have a board member uh, McPherson with uh, Jesus Garcia Perez and myself uh, taking a picture and it, it was really fun to see uh, Jesus there and interacting with uh, the participants. So uh, a good handful of board uh, members there. Uh, the second component of this program is really the partnership with RTC. They have Measure D funds. And so whenever you take a, a ride on Metro, you're contributing via Measure D to the two nonprofits. So uh, if you're a, a rider, you would go in, you download the phone app, you'd sign up and, and it, for every 25 rides that you take on Metro, $10 is then uh, distributed to one of those two organizations. And it's the rider's choice where, which of the two, either the, the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary or the Bay of Life. So, um, 
you know, just running loose estimates, being very conservative, knowing our contracts coming up and opportunities with vendors and our ridership. You know, Danielle, your marketing director and your public affairs director, and I, you know, guesstimate that probably about a million dollars in the next five years can flow into protecting the Monterey Bay. So that's a great program. Great to see it kicked off and uh, really looking for great things to come. I just I just wanted to review ever so quickly the three goals that we have that we're working on really uh, daily to pull off for you. And that is to increase ridership to 7 million rides a year within five years. And to, if we can at all help it by zero emission vehicles moving forward. Uh, you know, we kind of have the cliche that, you know, at Metro every day is Earth Day and our biggest goal is to not buy any tailpipes as we buy future buses. So. We're working on that. I just want to show you ever so slightly in a couple of seconds how that's going. And then to that third goal being to develop housing units on Metro property, being that, uh, you know, housing is just such a difficult challenge uh, in the county to have affordable housing. So here's your ridership. Um, you'll notice John, uh, almost every time he opened his mouth, he talked about the importance of speed, frequency, and reliability with the bus system. By far, those are the two biggest things or the three biggest uh, uh, characteristics that attract riders to your system. So just in the couple of months that we've had this goal of getting to 7 million within five years, we've introduced the one ride at a time project, which will have an impact on ridership. The youth K through 12, the ride free pilot project that you approved today will have a big impact. And then equally big impact will be your short and your long-term planning, this reimagining Metro to find more speed, frequency, and reliability in your bus system. So that's where we're at with ridership and we're working really aggressively behind the scenes. Uh, that is the top goal at the agency is to get more folks on the buses to enjoy Metro and to have an impact. Um, I wanted to brief you really quickly on the zero emission vehicles and this is a really challenging project. Um, we mentioned in the workshop we had a couple of months ago with the board that you have a pretty tired fleet. In fact, you have 100 buses and the bottom 30% or the bottom 30 buses, the oldest ones, have an average life of 20 years, which, which a, a bus, generally speaking, through the FTA, which most likely has bought in the buses that you look at, you know, the shelf life on a bus, it's a its life is 12 years. So to have an average fleet uh, in your bottom 30 of 20 years is uh, speaks to how tired the fleet really is. So under the progress bullet point, I wanted to show you what Wandamu and the planning staff and others at Metro have accomplished over the last few months. We've assembled the money. We spoke briefly about this at the workshop, but we assembled the funding for 12 uh, your first 12 hydrogen buses. That's the one of the two zero emission technologies. So you actually have in the queue at the manufacturer 12 hydrogen buses. And so we'll be coming to you very shortly to approve formally the purchase of those buses and then move them uh, in the queue as a formal purchase. Um, we also have five battery electric buses that were funded by the federal government, and we have ordered those. You've already approved those buses in a previous uh, order a month or two ago. And then you may have seen uh, a news release. Uh, we're putting out a new news release this coming week just to reiterate what happened, but the federal government through RTC funded four additional hydrogen buses for Metro. Uh, and this was a grant uh, that was received in the amount of $30 million for those four hydrogen buses and also funding for the bus on shoulder project. So that's a really, really big deal. It's a big award. And uh, again, we're gonna recreate, we're gonna basically send out a, an additional news release on that with some quotes uh, in this coming week. So you might see that hit the media again. And then last but not least, we've got a grant that'll be submitted on or before February 10th for an additional 12 hydrogen buses with the hydrogen fueling station to, to fuel the buses. So you have 21 buses basically on order and an additional 12 that we're applying for in an upcoming grant. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on how uh, diligent staff has been to get the fleet turned over and to steer away from anything that has a tailpipe. 
none of these buses uh, will have that tailpipe. And then last but not least, um, I know our, your time's precious, but I, you had this goal of uh, developing more than 175 housing units within the decade. And that's a big challenge. You do have property at your stations. Uh, and I wanted to show you the three projects that we're working on, plus a couple of conceptual designs for the first time to the board. Uh, you're well aware of the Pacific Station North. That's a has multiple partners, including the city of uh, Santa Cruz, but we're redeveloping uh, the downtown Pacific Station. It'll have 124 housing units that will be developed with a brand new Metro uh, Transit Center. We've shown you uh, some conceptuals of that in prior board meetings, so I won't go down that road today, but uh, the other two projects we're developing are 60 housing units in conjunction with a paracruise facility at property that Metro owns at SoCal and Highway 1, uh, where those two uh, roadways intersect. Um, and more on that is forthcoming. We had the architect Brian uh, Spector come to the workshop and talk to you about that project. So I won't go any further because it's still kind of moving along, but we haven't got to the next goal or the next uh, milestone on that to bring to you additional information. But the third bullet point, uh, this is a fairly new project uh, that we're working on. We're working on very this project very closely with the city staff at Watsonville uh, with the community development director and her staff. It's to redevelop the Watsonville Transit Center, which is pretty tired and 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 it's an old bank building uh, which has kind of been renovated for our use over the over the years. Uh, but redeveloping it will offer better uh, spacing for the transit center. Uh, and I wanted to show you uh, what the conceptuals look like because this is a component of that grant that we're submitting on February 10th. We're asking for $10 million on this Watsonville Transit Center redevelopment project, which will include 60 housing units. So this was kind of the first look at uh, some the conceptual designs of what will be included in the grant to, to give it more uh, more emphasis. This is kind of a corner look. Uh, as you're looking at where the transit center currently stands, there's a bank building, basically, as I mentioned, that's been renovated on this street corner where the transit center is currently located. So that would be scraped. The whole property would be scraped. And on the bottom floor, uh, what we're envisioning for purposes of working with the city of Watsonville staff and future permitting, as well as uh, with the grant, is that on the bottom floor, you would uh, see perhaps a community dental clinic. Uh, we've had some interest in that from uh, partners. And then uh, also within the bottom floor would be the lobby for Metro for passengers to wait for buses and uh, an office space for Metro staff. And then also there would be space on the bottom floor for um, our partner with the uh, with the housing that you see on the second, third, and fourth floor. So I have a couple of additional views. Uh, it's early on in the project. Uh, another view, kind of at the other end of the building. You see, we've incorporated some murals into the building, uh, some nice angles and looks at the building so that it's attractive. Um, there's a bike share uh, project that we've got incorporated in the development of the building that's within the grant. Here's a, a different angle of just about the same location uh, where you were looking on the previous conceptual design. You can see that the buses will basically park in sawtooth fashion along the frontage uh, of the street in front of the building. Uh, here it says Metro Transit and Mobility Center. Uh, so you'll you'll walk in, you'll see a lobby where you can wait for the bus. You can interact with the customer service folks and get information, buy passes. But there will also be a mobility center incorporated into that area, which will show and teach folks how to ride the bus system. I think I just have one more kind of a larger aerial type view, and this one shows the different uh, features that we have going into the project. At the back of the building where it says letter L or has written letter L, that would be some paracruise parking as well as some staff parking, your supervisors and so on. But uh, this is shaping up to be a really 
great redevelopment project that'll add a lot of value to the downtown area. It really meshes well with the downtown specific plan. It's becoming a very attractive project visually and functionally. And it will, uh, the, identified pro uh, the identified partner on the housing is MidPen, which uh, stands for Mid Peninsula. And we have had previous projects with MidPen, the multi-unit housing immediately adjacent to this building in the Watsonville Transit Center today is a MidPen housing project that's on Metro property. So we're continuing with that partnership into this project. And as I mentioned, uh, also have a dental uh, nonprofit that works with uh, uh, low income and uh, you know residents with need to, to have dental work done. So um, with that, uh, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, there's a lot going on. I, I you know, we, we've talked about, uh, uh, you know, the need to hire more operators. We've got six in training that'll soon be out on the road and uh, operating and revenue service. We've got 52 applications right now from the latest recruitment yes. that we're, work, we're working through. <laughs> So yeah, that's a, I'm with you, Director Rodkin. That's a <laughs> yeah. yes. That's a lot of work and a lot of work on the HR and on operations. Uh, mm -hmm. These folks are working around the clock to get through the applications and get the next class started. Uh, just a quick update: you've got your um, automatic vehicle location system, which is a major capital project that we've been working on. That's still on track to be done in February, as promised to the board. And that will allow you in real time to see what's really going on with your system. And then you've got your automated passenger counter capital project uh, that will be done in July, as promised to the board. And that allows us to see boardings and alightings at bus stops to be able to manage decision making better. It allows even your passengers to not only track in real time the buses, but to see whether they're full or not so that they can uh, better plan their day. And then the last thing I will say, only because this is just like one of those major things that's taking a lot of time uh, with your staff is, uh, you know, uh, Chuck, your CFO, Chuck Farmer, is leading our efforts with the triennial review. And this is the most thorough review that a transit agency receives. It's, it's done by the federal government. It happens every three years. And they literally go through every aspect of the agency and report to the board how staff is doing with managing the transit system. And so it's it's a big deal. It, it, it kicks off in February with all the materials that they ask for being due. And then it culminates with the report in September to the board. So I just wanted to let you know, staff, uh, between uh, those three goals, the other projects in this triennial review, your staff, uh, I think they're beginning to sleep here, uh, Chair Pegler, uh, but you've got com committed people and uh, we're really uh, pretty excited for the future. Very exciting stuff, Michael. Uh, comments or questions from our board? Mike? Um, I thought um, that the uh, Federal Transit Administration had changed the life of a bus that they would pay for replacement from 12 to 14 years. Is that not the case? We weren't happy about that, but I, I thought that that had been the case. And that in other words, when you apply for, they pay for 80 or 90% of the price of a new bus and we pay our, our local share. And some, depending on the grant, sometimes we, we overmatch, but um, that they would only pay for that if the bus was at least, uh, they initially was 12 years, but I thought it had changed to 14. Yeah, good question. I've heard it both ways. Uh, John Wandamu, uh, what is the latest on the, the the life cycle of a bus? Yeah, so um, basically, you know, 12 to 14, it was increased to 14 during the Bush administration. But again, uh, most of, uh, of course, a third of our fleet is still beyond their useful life of, you know, roughly the average is 19 to 21 years. So it helps, but it's still a uh, third of our fleet is beyond the useful life. It is 14 yeah. then, Wanda Moon, the FTA. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So we're well beyond that anyway. Yes. All right. Jebra? 
Thank you for that report. Um, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you to you and the Metro team and then the bus drivers for your storm response. Um, the communication was really effective and really timely and you made it really easy for me to share out through my network. So just wanna acknowledge and thank you for that. Um, and I wanna thank you, Michael, for bringing the three goals and sharing progress as part of these uh, reports. I think it's really helpful. Sometimes we establish goals and we put them on a shelf and then three years later, we're like, where are we? So. It's helpful to see the um, milestones, the big milestones that we're making. And then I have a question. I apologize if you mentioned this during your report and I missed it. I know the PAC station North uh, 124 units are affordable housing units, all of them 100% affordable housing. How about the two other projects? Yeah, they're, they're shaping up to be 100% affordable housing as well. Wonderful, thank you. Oh, and sorry, one last thought has comment is, um, I imagine that one of the one of the challenges in recruiting bus drivers is lack of housing that's affordable. Um, so just the thought idea of if any of these housing units could be designated towards our team at the Metro and bus drivers at the Metro. I don't know. Something Good to comment. explore. Thank you. Good comment. Thank you, Shevra. Uh, Manu. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and thank you, Michael. I also want to echo great job with uh, with the three goals. You know, I always tell my analysts, keep it to the rule of threes. Uh, it's what people can remember. And so I think you're doing a great job um, overall with uh, providing leadership for the organization and also making it uh, easy to understand and easy to communicate with the public what we're doing. Um, and also, so just wanted to comment, I'm really excited to hear that uh, I think we can get 60 units on that Live Oak site with the, the Paracruz project. My my feeling since you know the original project we were considering was just it was, it's too short. I mean, you know, why build one story next to a highway, um, especially when we need housing so badly? I mean, for the whole community, but for for drivers and, and public employees too. Um, so glad to hear we can get sixty units on there or thereabouts. I mean, heck, the more the merrier. Uh, I look forward to seeing some renderings of that. And the Watsonville project looks awesome too. Very good, thank you, Monu. Um, any other comments from our board? I see one from the public, uh, Michael Passano. Michael, would you like to speak? Thank you so much, Michael, for the um, presentation. And I agree with the past comments to add um, some for workforce housing for drivers and your and Metro staff would be uh, a, a great help, I'm sure. Thank you. Great, thank you, Michael. All right, I think unless there's other comments or questions, I think we are drawing near the close of our meeting. And with that, I would announce that our next meeting will be on Friday, February 24th, 9 a.m. It will continue to be by teleconference. And with that, I adjourn today's meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Larry. Thanks Thank your time. Thanks, everybody. We're going to meet again. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>